Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing, with our Board President, Doug Leeds. Welcome to today's program. The American Musical Theatre is a thriving and enduring fixture on the stage today and would not exist without some very talented men and women. They're the composers who write the music and the lyricists who write the words. And sometimes, one person does both. Today we'll meet several of Broadway's outstanding composers and lyricists who will share their stories about getting musicals off the page and onto the stage. We'll be back later to tell you more about the work of the American Theatre Wing. But right now, please join us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. They write the words and the music that evolve into that unique art form, the American musical. Hello, I'm Pia Lindstrom for the American Theatre Wing, and joining us to talk about the joys and the challenges of their work are some of the theater's leading composers and lyricists. And, and Lynn Ahrens, sort of living was, William Finn, write, Stephen uh, Flaherty, and study. Adam Geffen. Welcome. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank Great. you. Great to be here. I'm looking at so many Tony Awards here. <laughs> Every one of you have won a Tony Award. So we have a great deal of information, a great deal of expertise here, and uh, we're going to find out all about it. First of all, can any story be made into a musical? Yes. Any story. What do you think, Lynn? I think it depends on who's adapting it, and you never know what's going to appeal. I, I for example, would never have thought that anyone would write a, a musical about a man buried up to his neck in the, in the earth, but there you have it. It was wonderful. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think anyone. Any I, story? I, I think it has to do with sensibility, you know, and there could be the, the most amazing story, but if, if you as an artist don't connect to that particular story, then there's not a musical there. You know, so I think it's a very personal thing, and I think we're all searching for the great story with our divining rods and trying to find the story that we connect to as artists, that we can make sing. If a, if a story has a musical, a, a, a need for music, a, a story mm -hmm. sort of must be told through music, it feels right to me. If you want to write it, if something speaks to you, you feel uh, you must write it, then you write it. Otherwise, you don't. Adam, mm -hmm. what spoke to you in Light in the Piazza? I just react to uh, the emotional connection I feel to a situation or character or circumstance. And that personal connection is what creates the energy to write. And without that, I don't uh, really... Right. <laughs> <laughs> what was personal in that particular case? Uh, well, The Light in the Piazza was a story um, uh, ab about emotional ambition and, 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 and hoping or reaching for um, real satisfaction in that area of life. And, um, and what happens when you receive that gift and, and what happens when you don't and everything in between. Um, and that was personal. Um, to me, uh, because that's an active issue, you know. And I feel that, uh, that the main character of the show was sort of arrested on the cusp of, of that romantic possibility, and, and, I, and I think all of us sort of are secretly still in that place. I know what the sunlight can be. Collaborators, yes, and we are. By the we way, are. Dressed dressed the same. It was obnoxious. And you yeah. actually it was, not it was an accident. Audience. And you look a little bit alike. I mean, you, there's a so re awful. resemblance, isn't there? Here. Well, I don't know. When you did know? you find each other? We uh, met. We met in um, 1983 in a in a songwriting workshop and uh, connected and enjoyed working together. And so it's been we're almost up to 25 years now. Yeah. Which so it's a little like a yeah, it was it was very fortunate. You know, I was like right off the bus, literally from the Midwest. And uh, I was in Manhattan one month, met Lynn. And within six months, we began writing with with one another. 
and that's been you know a number of years now. Long right? time. A long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, were you really going exciting. to the NYU school? Were you going to the? Oh, Brown I was. School I, I was, but but they had delayed it a year, so we began. I I, I did right. go there right. for right. several right. months, like a, a year later, but I, I found it uh, frustrating because I wanted to be writing as opposed to talking about writing. You, you're, the, the, you're doing the score, Vince doing the lyrics. Right. Um, how does that work out? Well, weirdly enough, <laughs> on, Stephen, a good day. on a good day it works out very well, <laughs> and on a bad day we drink a lot of coffee and part ways. Um, Stephen actually was writing lyric, his own lyrics when I first met him, and I was writing my own music. What? Um, yeah, we both do yeah. both. I, I must say I'm, I'm a rather primitive composer, but I can play piano a little, and I write a mean melody, mm -hmm. and he's a very good lyricist. So although we've let those two skills um, you know, go into the background when we work together, I think we inform each other's work a lot because I, I can make some musical contributions and he can make lyrical contributions, and um, so it's really helpful. In a certain way, it's almost like you're one another's editor. Yeah. You know, it's which is really an interesting thing. I think to write successfully in any partnership, I think you have to understand both how words fit with music and musically um, how that enhances not only the emotion of of the line but also the drama of of what's happening in a moment. Who edits you if you have to do the lyrics right. and the music right. and the orchestration? Well, um, oftentimes my Collaborators uh, in uh, on a show who are other have other disciplines and uh, you know, the director and the book writer and and friends and colleagues um, and then first and foremost any paying ticket buyer. Um, oh yeah, is a very good editor. <laughs> they tell you they really they really, really do. They, they really in. <laughs> they don't pull any punches. <laughs> Let me find out a little bit about when you first saw a Broadway show or you first saw theater. When I was about 11, I, I saw Golden Boy. Wow. On mm -hmm. Broadway um, with Sammy Davis Jr., Charles Strauss, Lee Adams. And um, I think that was, that was the first thing I saw and what's, on Broadway. what's something said, I want to do that? No. no. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was when I was <laughs> at I camp, in Camp Joseph in Harrison, Maine. Oh, and, okay. and I was playing nicely, nicely in, in Guys and Dolls. And everyone was, and I was 11, and everyone else was 16 and 17, and I had a ball, and and I thought that score was so much fun, and that that was the beginning of it. And, and then I, 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 the movie of Bye Bye Birdie, I think, came out with Charles Strauss Lee Adams, written by Charles Strauss Lee Adams, and, and I said to my father, could, could you get a copy of Bye Bye Birdie? And he brought back the Broadway version, and, and at first I was incensed. I said, this doesn't have the song Bye Bye Birdie, what am I gonna do? And then I listened to it, I said, it's better. They cut out the best stuff from the show. So that's when I thought, ah, you know, I, I, I like this music. But why don't, didn't you continue as an actor, as a singer and actor? One goes to one's strength. So, oh, um, oh, okay. You know, if <laughs> so you one did, is smart enough. <laughs> so you discovered you had this these attributes. Well, you know, I when you're young, except for Adam, who you know, but when when you're young, you, you don't know what you're doing, and, and you don't know if you have any talent, and 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 you just hope you do, right. and so you're you're out there blind, and and you think, well, this is what I want to do. I have no idea if I have the, the talent to do it, or what whatever. I it, it's more than talent. I, if I have the need to do it, if I have the strength to do it, and everything, so. You, you just hope that something clicks. Um, that's Lynn, all. Lynn, you studied journalism. I was a journalism major, and I went into advertising out of college, weirdly enough. But um, I, I, the, first, the first show that ever um, opened my eyes to Broadway musicals was Fiddler on the Roof, um, which I happened to see with Bette Midler uh, playing the oldest daughter. And um, I remember uh, being rather stunned by the show, and, and it was the first time that I realized somebody wrote shows. I just thought they somehow sprang fully fledged onto a stage, and it, I'd never given it a thought, but I got very intrigued with the idea of the words. And um, knowing Sheldon Harnick as I do now, and considering him a friend, uh, I'm, I'm, it's amazing to me you know, that I've come all this way um, from that moment. But um, when I graduated from college, I thought I was going to be a journalist or a copywriter, and I was a copywriter for a little while. Um, but very gradually wended my way into songwriting uh, and um, children's television. And one form of songwriting led to another. And when I met Stephen, um, I thought writing for theater would be a lark. And it turned out to be more than that. So here we are. When did you first go to the theater, Stephen? 
when the nuns took me. I, I was 12 <laughs> years old and uh, went to Catholic school, and they took us to Godspell because it had Jesus in it. You know, so we were looking, really looking forward to see Jesus live on the stage. You know, <laughs> so the whole motley crew of us in Pittsburgh went down to the the old Nixon Theater on Liberty Avenue, right in the middle of the porn houses. It was like sort of a kind of really exciting trip. You know, so, so we were seeing Godspell live on stage, and there was something about seeing the, such a simple production. You know, there was nothing but in that production but you know, sort of like a chain link fence, and seeing this uh, theater made of nothing. Um, and and the, the, the pop feeling you know, of, of, of the score, you know, we must have been maybe 12, it was probably like 72. And it was the first musical I had ever been exposed to. Then, like the second one was Carousel, actually, mm. and I thought, oh, there are there are shows written before Godspell, you know. <laughs> and so that was like a big learning curve for me. And uh, two years later, I wrote my first show when I was 14 uh, with friends of mine, and and we did it in my high school, and and so. Um, it was exciting. Well, you yeah. wrote the music. I wrote the music. But yeah. I mean, did you have musical training? You played the yeah, piano yeah. at home. You I, I had I had an, an amazing teacher, and I was lucky to have found him. I began playing whenever I was seven, and uh, I had one great teacher uh, who taught me everything about music. He taught me show music, classical music, uh, harmony, composition, arranging. Uh, he basically opened the door to music for me. So a man mm. named uh, Bill Crystal, and he was sort of a problematic kind of guy. He hated kids. You know, so it took me a, a while to get beyond that <laughs> until I could, so I could find my way into music and, and it was it was wonderful. And uh, so then I studied composition and uh, you know wanted to legitimate you know become a, a legitimate mu musician as opposed to like some guy who played you know show tunes in R&B. Adam you probably grew up with music because your grandfather was Richard Rogers and you heard his music I suppose and your mother was very involved in the theater. Yes, she was, but by the time I came along, she was somewhat phasing out of that, and uh, surprisingly, the household was not, uh, it was sort of pre-Maria. Uh, <laughs> it was sort of, it was, it was sort of a quiet household, because my mother was writing books at that time. Ah, and, so uh, the, it, and music, the music was, was not distracting for oh, her. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> but I started singing uh, professionally when I was quite young, and that was a great uh, introduction to the family, really, of, mm -hmm. of making um, theater pieces. And why didn't you continue singing? Uh, well, when my voice changed, it turned into a very light, high tenor and uh, a pretty uh, destructible one. It wasn't a, a robust sound. Um, so it's, it's serviceable for, for what I do now, but it wasn't something that I could pursue at the, as a career. Do you think the ability to write music is something that is can be inherited, like mathematics skills or things? Is this... Anybody have a family Not member? Well, I think probably. Having just read an article in the Times about th there's a gene that allows you to taste uh, bitter tastes as in Brussels mm. sprouts, yes. I would think that musical <laughs> genes were, were... I think it's the same gene, I, I, think <laughs> it's the same gene. <laughs> I, I think we've all had bitter tastes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why. <laughs> well, let's get a little bit to the actual process. How would you two feel about sitting here and showing us a little bit of the process of the words and the music being put together. Is that possible that you what could? Do? Generally well, speaking, the lyrics come first. Actually, Actually no. no. <laughs> Actually, no. <laughs> OK. Actually, no. I'll just, I'll just Please, lean. Please, move I'll over. Lean. Give her a space. No, I yeah. don't need a space. There. You don't need a space? No. OK. Um, so she's standing. We, we, we actually, so, in our collaboration, write yeah. a lot in the room together. You know, so it's so it's oh. it's an interesting thing. A lot a lot Sounds of like times, uh, music comes first. You know, Lynn actually prefers you know, to find I the way into I, it in yeah. the music. I think it was Marilyn Bergman said that the words are on the tips of the music, and mm. I feel that that's so true. And if I hear a melody, I hear every time I hear words to it, I just know where they go. And it's much easier for me to do it that way than to write the words first. Mm. So, but yeah. but it, but sometimes I do. You know, it depends. I mean, there, there's well, I just thought of an example from Once on This Island actually, where. The first opening notes of the show were written by Stephen, I believe, on the subway or something. He, he that's I'm, where I'm the inspiration writer, came. Right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah and, seriously. Yeah. And he just play those yeah, little yeah. notes, and then and it's only four notes. That's but it. it. And I went, oh, those are the prayers to the gods. Asaka, grow me a garden, and then it evolved from there. So it, that's how it works. It, it just something musical and islandy came out of his. Do you read a lot of poetry? I do, actually. Does that help? I to, think, I uh, think poetry informs 
lyrics and, and it forms any kind of writing, I think. More so than doing the book, because if you're writing the book, you don't need to know well, poetry. Well, you don't, Do but you? In, a, in a way, you know, the, the imagery of poetry, the, the lyricism of it, the, the word pictures that it paints, that sort of emotional punch that you get from a good poem. So if you had to do the music, the, the lyrics first, give him a lyric, and then how would you write the well, I mean, music I, to that? I mean, that's happened before, like with in Ragtime, for example, like a song like Back to Before. Right. Where, where it was a song that was absolutely lyrics first, and they were incredibly long sentences. And I'm looking at this on a page, and it's like, you know, a lot of a lot of times lyrics sort of have a contour to them, and this was like really long, long sentences. And so early I, in the morning. So I, just... really early in the morning. I'm a night person. So I took I, so I took it up to my roof uh, because I was actually going to an astrologist at the time. He said you must think expansively, <laughs> and I was living in an incredibly small studio apartment on the fourth floor, very dark, very tiny. And he mm -hmm. said you know think expansively. So I said okay. So I like took the Lynn's lyric from my fax machine and went up to the roof, and I just started walking in a circle. You know, trying to find the rhythm of of the lyric, not necessarily the melody, but the rhythm. Oh. And I, I would say within within five to ten minutes, I not only I had did I have the rhythm, but I had the melody. So I'm can like we play a pressing, little bit of it so we can uh, hear. What, sure, what? sure. So I'm like pressing like the elevator, like please, oh. like four, four, four. <laughs> you know, so I, I didn't forget it. You know, so it's uh, do you want to sing part of that or? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> or, it's just us. It's okay. Right. Just imagine Marin Maisie. <laughs> <laughs> There was a time our happiness seemed never ending. I was so sure that where we were heading was right. That's it. I'm going to go up on my list. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's, that's, that was beautiful. We can, uh, yeah, we, yeah. And the interesting thing is, Lynn had told me way after the fact that she had used a dummy melody for. I had for a that melody particular, in my mind. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that wasn't even in the same meter, which is interesting when you think of that. Yeah. You know, it's like. So, huh. so I said, "What was it?" And she said, "Oh, that was better that, than what what I had in mind." So it's an interesting thing, you know. So I never knew what it what I'm it was. I'm gonna go back to my chair. You can now. go back to your chair. I'm gonna go yeah. back to the chair. Oh, you can stay. You can you stay with it. Now I'm playing the songs of William Finn. In case I have to sing again. <laughs> well, the I was listening. I saw the just saw the glorious oh. ones. Oh, you and did? It sounds a little bit. It sounded Italian. It sounded a little bit. It had that that flavor right. yeah. in there. So obviously, when you write the music, you also have to place it within the context of the time? Oh, the, sure. So would you study a great deal about that era? Or you see Fellini films. I see watched Fellini a lot films. of Fellini, yeah. Fellini? yeah. And I, and I, was, I was thinking of three, like a virtually every song in the show has some element of 3-4 right. to it. So it's, you know, like Tarantella's and, oh. you know, and I think it's the most European thing that I've ever, ever done. And I, I adored working on that show. Our God, how we sweat it, and Christ, how we curse. Travel by day and by night, we rehearse. Each said and costume the first for the best. And oh, Scala was a man obsessed. When music is your primary language, it has a kind of syntax of its own. It has verbness and objectness and nounness. I mean, it, it can. Like that first beautiful melody that Stephen played before the words were laid on top of it had its own sort of meaning. Uh, at least to me, that's what music sounds like. It seems to have um, syntax. But it has it's, to it's have. It's interesting, though, that that tune, though, was actually inspired by the lyric. And uh, Lynn had actually had the word crossroads. And whenever the word, uh, with, with, with never a crossroad in sight, and whenever I got to the word crossroads, I went, to a totally different harmonic place, you know, and I don't know that I would have done that if I didn't have that particular text to set, you know. So it's mm -hmm. it's an interesting thing. It's a chicken and an egg kind of thing, you know, because I think if music comes first, I think I probably would have gone a different place, you know, with that particular song. Mm -hmm. Bill, does the, do the words come first for you, or the the first line usually comes first, um, and I take from the f first line, and then I play it down. And I I dummy in. Some lyrics, but I, I my dummy lyrics are very good, and and sometimes <laughs> um, they're lyrics that I stay with. But but I, it's the first line that I get that I then musicalize, and then I work musically down, and then. Um, but I'm I'm much more influenced by by lyrics. Um, I, I'm 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 a lyricist first, and and uh, a composer second. 
And if one student learns the wonders of poetics, then he's mine, and my work here will be done. And if one student values structure, learns that words can be valuable and fun, show me 20 students who despise the poems they have to memorize. All right, I need only one. So in falsettos, for example, the, the words came first? Well, I, 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 uh, four Jews in a room bitching, uh, I, I was walking across the park, and I, I couldn't believe that I finally got the opening number, and I had to get to my friend's house. It was, she was, she was a, a resident on East 68th Street, and I had a long way to go, and I'm just seeing four Jews in a room bitching <laughs> through, through <laughs> New York City, hoping it. that I wouldn't forget. Right, right. I wouldn't forget. <laughs> See, that's the amazing thing where, you know, where you find inspiration, I think, in, as, especially living in Manhattan, you know, as we all do, I think. It just pops up, you know, walking across town, you know, walking through a park, you know, on a subway. It's amazing. What about you? Is it always at the piano? Do you work at the piano or you get ideas in the shower? Uh, less and less because muscle memory That's is right. a way to really limit yourself creatively. I, I, as a matter really? of fact, one of the reasons I'm not going to be playing today is that I actually do not know how to play the piano currently. I, I mean, I do not know how to play the piano right now. I'm just not you writing you the You used to know how, and then you well, forgot I mean, I, it? I, when I get back to it, I, I, I'm just not writing oh. um, at the piano. I'm trying to uh, work in a different way to make sure that I stay sort of limber and, and not attached to you know the same old things that my hands want to do. Oh, that's very interesting. <clears throat> so it's a, uh, finding another part of the brain that, that hears? I totally agree with Adam. I absolutely know what, what you mean by that. Because there's something about, if you go to a keyboard, you know, your fingers go to, to the places the that you know, place. the comfortable places. Mm -hmm. And with Once on a Silent, for example, I couldn't, uh, it's a rhythm-based show. And it's about a, a pr more primitive culture. And, and I, it's, it's something that didn't want to be written at the piano. It, it, it had to be about rhythm, it had to be about body language, it had to be about the rhythm of the body, it was about dance. So I found that the less and less I hung out with the piano, the better the score got. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, it's as if you, you slowly gain um, control over your material, and the material is, is the characters and the circumstance, and, and you wanna stay in a sort of random access, cut That's and right. pa paste place with all that. Um, and, and sometimes, for me, the, the, one of the last steps is actually manifesting it in music and words. It's, you know, it's more of an emotional computation. So it's not like Mozart, who heard the whole melody coming and had to write it down as fast as he could. Um, not, not for me. Has I, anybody had that experience <laughs> with the melody yes. comes? Yes. Yeah. Well, not, not, not the whole song. I don't get the whole song. But you get. I, I've, I have gotten. There's, a, there's a, a song of mine called. Uh, when the earth stopped turning, oh, it's where, a song. where would you like I, to play? I, 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 if I could, I would. Okay, you, you um, can't play either. What is this? Oh, I, I, no, I, 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 I don't have the, the same problems. I'll, I'll play something. But that song, I, I woke up in the middle of the night. Usually, I, I, I everything I write is at the piano, oh. for me. Um, but that song, I woke up in the middle of the night. I went to the piano. I, I got it. I worked on it for about forty-five minutes. Went back to sleep. Woke up the next day, and and whenever that happens, the few times it's happened, you're, you you approach the piano so gingerly, hoping that you just really haven't screwed up because it, it seems to you you wrote something marvelous, and usually it's stinky, but this time it was pretty good. Um, no, but let me play you a little nothing. Yeah. So you so you always work at the piano. Um, that, that, or you generally speaking. Oh, I always work at the piano. You work at the piano, okay, and you sing your lyrics, or do you speak them? No, I don't speak that. <laughs> I, actually, this is you a... You act I'd rather be standing yet I would... I sing everything falsetto. Oh, yeah. You know, um, everything falsetto. <laughs> Every Thanksgiving, Mark made his all-male Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and then put the turkey and then made the cranberry sauce for the mess. <laughs> You know, you, you, are you serious? You did it in falsetto? I'd rather sing okay. than yes, I would. Oh, falsetto, oh, yeah. yeah. Which is better? <laughs> On an open sea, <laughs> I'd stand at the railing of my foot, feeling wild and free. The sun is on my neck. <laughs> See 
is incredibly blue And I'd rather be sailing Yes, I'd want to go sail Than come home to you and here's Did you I just make this up? But I submerged, I submerged <laughs> Sex is good so I, I'm thinking I have a good song there This then is I a go very good song no, but then I go Write it down Sex here. is good But I'd rather be Sailing, <laughs> food is nice, but I'd rather be sailing. People are swell, but I'd rather be sailing over the horizon. And now I know. I know why you don't have a collaborator. You no, could do it all. The thing is, no, I, did, I did have a collaborator on, on uh, Spelling Bee. Did you? Which was great because basically what would happen is she would, because I'm older and fatter, she would schlep her computer over to my place <laughs> and um, from Brooklyn, and she'd come in looking so bedraggled, Rachel Schenken, the lovely Rachel Schenken, and she'd, she'd be working, and she starts, she starts typing, and I'm there reading the paper, and she's typing. And I'm reading the paper. We're talking. We we talk, you know, reading the paper. <laughs> then I do the crossword puzzle, and she's she's typing, and and we're talking. We're That's talking. That's a good collaborator. Uh, this is a good collaborator. I, I, I answer you. my phone call. She's typing. <laughs> she, and, yeah, she's not bothered. She's typing, 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 typing. We go to lunch. I paid for lunch because I hadn't worked all morning, and she had. And then we come back, and I take a nap. And then I wake up from nap, and uh, I said, okay, I'm going to write now. And I'm yelling, do you like this? Do you like this? She's in the other room. She said, I can't hear you. I'm working. So, and, and then How did you do such an adorable show as that, the 25th? Annual Putnam County Be Spelling Bee. Oh, uh, because I'm adorable? I don't, I don't know the question. <laughs> County Spelling Bee. We speak so damn convincingly. They're nervous, but they're grinning. It seems we're living out our dreams. How could you do this show if you're interrupting and she, you're just having lunch and we when were did you work? We were having fun. I mean, you just have more fun. We were than working, working the whole. We were working the whole. I was working. We were working. It's just you work different ways. A very noisy way. And it sounds not, like. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, you, you, you know, you're not always at the piano working. You have to find out what the song's about. Do you two talk while you're working, or are you just we, we, singing we and about the first, I would say, hour of every time we get together. D gossiping, oh. <laughs> drinking coffee, talking, seeing what's up, you know, kind of thing. And then we sort of... Zeroing in on the yeah. moment. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then we kind of wend our way. And that, it takes yeah. a little you time gotta, to it does. You gotta yeah. ease it. It does, in. and you have to mm -hmm. sometimes approach the idea sideways, too, you know? There's something... If I were just sitting at the piano, there's something about the piano crossing its arms and saying, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know? Oh, and sometimes you have, to do, you have to find creative <laughs> ways to, to approach a, an idea sideways, you know, whether it's weeding, in a garden, or whether it's walking across the street, or you know, pacing on your the roof of your apartment building, you know, all of these ways are sort of ways of ambushing. So the yeah, song. you have to sneak up on. Yeah, the song. you got to sneak up on the song. Now, when you and, and it's not ready until it's ready and, and ready to present itself. It sounds bizarre, but that's. You, that's and sometimes the song yeah. keeps its secrets. That's right. And it, it, yeah. it's not willing. I mean, they're. The world's going to think we're mental, but no, it's but true. The, it's the, true. The, the song is not willing to let you add it That's right. until yeah. until you've gotten you've earned it until you're you know exactly what you're doing with it. Did you have musical training? Very little, as you can tell. No, I can't tell. You played oh, very you're so well. Oh, you so lovely, <laughs> <laughs> as they could tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you didn't actually study composition. I, I studied composition and used to flunk out of courses. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You didn't need to g learn anything then. Are you self taught no, no, no. and well, auto didactic? Actually, and then I went to, I, I was taking some courses in California, and I was taking two different courses, and, and both professors said, 
let me hear your music. And, and they heard the music and they said, we don't know how you know what you're doing, but what you're doing is, is right. What you're doing is fine. We're screwing you up. They said, just keep on doing what you're doing. And I, it was an enormous gift. Really? That they, they gave me. So sometimes training, it's not that people who might want to go into this profession should necessarily get training. Would you, would I, you advise that? I often advise. You went to Yale. I, I did. Did you study music there? I, I, I majored in music, but I wouldn't do that again if I were going to go back to college. I really? would just yeah. major in history. And really? I think if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And, and I often advise people not to train too much and just to get to it and respond to um, their collaborators and make something and then... Um, that generates so much energy and uh, so much enthusiasm and curiosity and ambition that it's just, for me, a more productive way in. Don't you have to, though, when you're doing the book and you're going to do a musical, have to know about construction? I mean, your opening number, your first scene number. This is, a, this this is, is a business of instinct. It's this really, instinct? it's a lot of it is instinct and just seeing what other people have done, seeing a lot of theater, reading a lot, um, as, as Adam said, responding to things you hear and, and things you discuss, and, and, and listening to audiences. When you get a show up, they will tell you when the structure isn't right. Mm. They will tell you when they're confused. They will tell you when they're and bored. how do they tell you? They open their programs, look at their watches, whisper <laughs> to their husbands, it's shuffle. It's food the food thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's All a, of a sudden, people have to go to the bathroom. They just go to the bathroom. You just know, and you just you know really? you have to tell. So yeah. where do you sit, Adam? When, when you're when you're, back. where do you go? In the back. In the back? Yeah. You all yeah. sit way in the back. I don't sit. I can't bear to sit. I you said you walk back walk and forth. You can't but do you're that looking at the audience. I know. The new house. There's no pacing. I know. You have. You're like the the back row is the literally. You never go up and sit in the sixth row and watch. In the, but in the new house, there's a, the place upstairs that I go. I go into the go there. I, that's, yeah. Yeah. And I dropped a Coke that. once on Bob Crowley oh. during the show. Oh, but, um, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Oh. So you're, you're back there because you're nervous, or you're back there because you hear better? You, no, you're back there because you don't want to be with the other people who are judging the show. Oh, you are it? no longer judging the show. You're trying to learn how to fix it. Right. You're or trying focus. to Yeah, you try, you're trying to see the audience as a whole from behind them and sort of from the side of them and react to when so when they start to cough a lot you say this I've got to fix that number that's right after you say you can, screw it, them that's right <laughs> <laughs> is the audience ever wrong mm, not, not really not likely mm -hmm. and and if the if, audience is never wrong I, I don't think they yeah. are individuals and, and, are always wrong yeah but well, the audience mm -hmm. is never wrong because as as a whole they cannot help but laugh if it's really funny mm. they cannot help but get bored if it's not or if they're very intent on what the story is they'll lean forward they're like ch a children's audience it's only older oh. it's really true they'll listen to the story or they'll you know sit back and rustle and um, often you can it's, call, it's you tempting can tell. To, to address uh, the problem or address the fact that an audience feels bored at a certain place address that that exact moment in the show and that can often be a mistake yeah. uh, right because you sort of have to trace backwards it's, it's always and what's, about what's, story it is yeah. always yeah. about story so we're here in clarity we're not clarity we're, we're, but but we're here as as the practitioners of, of the, the lyrics and 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 and, and music and it's we're, we're just kind of the, the icing on, on the cake. So I it's mean, not that there could be a brilliant score and it be a success because, and the book's not very good. Well, it, it's that very rare, rare that that happens. It can But happen. it could happen the other way around. Well, people are much, uh, an audience is much happier when there's an, an interesting, funny book and the score is, 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 is not good. so distinguished. It is an instinctive business and it is a business in which, um, you know, you're 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 sort of running on energy and 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 um, hunches a lot of the time. And once you get your show up and running, um, you really don't know what you have until an audience of some kind walks in there, even if it's in a workshop or a reading or whatever. Um, and it takes experience, and it takes. That's one of the things I think is is unfortunate about the the place we are now in theater is that young writers don't have a chance to get productions up and fail and get another production well, they up. they do at the Barrington stage. Yes, well, that's true. And, and, and new, that's the new theater. true. I'm, I'm yeah. running, I'm producing that's a bunch of new shows, so good. Yeah. trying to introduce new, new writers to the world. And we're, we're just choosing writers Fantastic. we like and, and letting them do whatever, do whatever they do is, and yeah. then keep with them yeah. because... It's the writers that I'm interested in, right. not the works necessarily. The works will come. Right. You mean the lyric writers or the, the well, they're whatever writers, they are. They're, they're, they're writers. songwriters of, of a sort, and 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 book writers. I I mean, book writers have to be taught how to write these books for musicals. It's very important.
Yes, that's yeah. I thought would be very complicated yeah. to write the book. I mean, that might be the most difficult. Then I write book. I, you, I've you do the book too. I you do. do too. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, so, but we, we've all done that in some form or fashion, and and um, it is. It's it's. It. I feel it's very instinctive. I, I don't know that there's anywhere you can go to study it necessarily, unless mm -hmm. you you know take a workshop where there. You know, we we Stephen and I co-chair this um, writing program at the Dramatists Guild, and. Um, we have young writers who come in every uh, two weeks and bring work in progress, and we try to critique them and help them, and we try to put it in the context of structure. There are playwrights in the class, and the playwrights are brilliant at helping the musical theater people uh, in terms of um, characterization and structure and, and vice versa. So, you know, there, there are places to go and learn it, but, you know, really, I mean, with, with the exception of... of uh, Barrington Stage, the, the program that Bill is doing up there, and you know there are things like it, but it's really hard. Well, I mean, also at NYU, the graduate yeah, program. Yeah, but but, but that... it used to be that young writers would go go to Broadway and they'd have a hit or a flop, and then right. they'd be invited back to Broadway, and that will never happen again. No, I they think. they have to be allowed to fail. Yeah, that's. I mean, we were. It's not criminal. No, it's no. it's it's not. Well, you criminal. didn't fail on your first. Yes, well, we let's did. discuss failure. Sort of. What did you What well, did we, you fail? <laughs> well, I'll just preface by saying we have this wonderful. Um, relationship with with Andre Bishop um, mm -hmm. yeah. and Ira Weitzman and um, they produced our, our first off-Broadway show Lucky Stiff which was you know a mixed mixed response I would say I don't think it was a success and then they said that's great come back and do another show what do you want to do and we said well we just did a European farce we'd like to do a Caribbean fairy tale yeah, was, and they, yeah, they yeah, were confused. I mean, uh, well, this, uh, um, <laughs> Lucky this? Stiff was sort of a frustrating experience for me in a certain way it, it's a charming show but there was absolutely no emotional content in that show. So I felt like I had so much lyricism welling, like sort of stifled. You know, I felt like I was some adolescent that needed to get that out. And, and the idea of Once on this Island uh, being able to use emotion to, to tell a story, which was essentially jubilant, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the idea of using sort of happy music for, you know, dramatic and dark moments, I thought was an interesting... Uh, situation and and, and uh, also the the idea of having sort of a a show that was sort of got sort of medium reviews you know Lucky Stiff and then having a theater saying we want to see you we want to see you again that was wonderful no, but yeah. Andre and Ira I think yeah, Andre and Ira Weissman yeah. we we've all worked yeah. with them and yeah. and uh, and they're they're fabulous and yeah. I mean I, I used to do shows in in my apartment when I was doing my first show in trousers, I would borrow chairs from the temple across the street and we, we, we would just do shows in the apartment. And um, I, I was at the piano and playing and playing Marvin and, and Alison Frazier and Mary Testa and Kay Pesek, who was in, were all, were all in that. And, uh, and Ira Weitzman, who was then head of the musical at theater Playwright. program at, at Playwrights and, and is seminal in, in kind of the development of the new musicals, uh, came up and said, would you like to begin our new musical series. And I said, well, I'm waiting on another show. I'll tell you in a few weeks. I mean, I did not know that Playwrights Rise was going to be the theater of the 80s. Is there a, a song that you think you wrote that's particularly good at expressing the emotion of a character? I just try to uh, uh, do a kind of method composing mm -hmm. routine and, and speak through the character. And if I can get worked up, you, you sort of have a, a precognition about what feels uh, emotionally um, legitimate mm -hmm. um, as you start to develop a song. And, and you have a kind of um, alarm that goes off or a red flag that goes up when it starts to feel disingenuous or unearned. And, and mm -hmm. you just try to stay on track uh, above all else, above pretty, above smart. Uh, uh, as you try to stay on track with with character and um, and you hope that you end up with something that will um, create empathy or identification in the audience. Do you have a song that you can think of that particularly reflected? I mean, in Ragtime, you know, I mean, that there, was... There's a song, so, well... Well, I, I mean, I, I, actually, in that, in that score, the thing that was interesting is there were so many different kinds of characters, and that's what I loved about yeah. writing the score of Ragtime. There were so many different groups involved, and each of these groups had a, de a different sensibility, came from a different world, they all had a different sound, and yet it was about America becoming itself. So just as a compositional exercise, the idea that it would be uh, not necessarily pure immigrant music, but it was somebody from the old country trying to be a modern American. Mm -hmm. There 
there was one song that I thought of when you asked that question, um, and it's it's a song for a young, um, uh, the young black woman named Sarah, who uh, in mm -hmm. the novel Ragtime is is doesn't say anything. There's no uh, she's she's really referred to, but there she her her role is never dramatized and. Um, when in our in adapting, we realize well, Sarah's a major character and, and triggers a huge um, plot point when in with the, in her dying. So we felt we had to write songs for her. Not to mention the fact that we had Audra McDonald sitting there and <laughs> sitting in she the can't be a mute, mute character. Mute. <laughs> you know. And we thought, are we like, ridiculous? You know, <laughs> yeah. there's like Audra McDonald yeah. sitting in the room and <laughs> so not we, singing. We so. wrote this this song for her um, for the character, and we wrote it in an afternoon. We or actually a morning. We gave it to Audra that afternoon, and she learned it that afternoon. And it you know never changed a word after mm. that, mm. Um, and what I love about the song is uh, it's called uh, Your Daddy's Son is that it in in a little really an A A B A song very short song form, it tells us that this wo young woman is uneducated because it uses diction, uh, that she might be a little superstitious because she talks about music casting a spell, that she's rash and impulsive and passionate because she um, has given birth alone, been deserted by Cole House Walker Jr. and has taken her baby and buried it in the ground. And we learn that, you know, this is a close reading of the lyrics, mm. you get this, um, that she's uh, also religious because she apologizes to God and to the infant. And, um, you know, all of that wrapped up into one very, very simple little song, really. We, we could play could you this play, much. Play a little, we'll little play bit, a so we just so have okay, some idea sure. what Can you're talking about. Can somebody get Audra McDonald in here? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. she, could, she could take it I from the bridge. I the building. <laughs> yeah, though, good, good. Just we'll to do give just us a little a idea bit. about sure. how you might have a character okay. that could then be expressed. Yes, My good. notion was um, that, that it could be a lullaby. a lullaby. And the idea that the further the song goes on, the more it comes out. And, and this yeah. is actually a song we wrote together in the same room. Yeah. Really quickly, really in, a, quick. in an afternoon, and our producer, Garth Drabinsky, was giving a barbecue for the cast, and he had heard through the grapevine, we had written a new song, and he said, I'm not giving you food unless Until you they play, play the song. song. <laughs> yeah, so, so we had to play this in order to we eat. Did. And I just, I'll just add that all those things I just said, I didn't think about one of them. I've only thought about it in hindsight. No, uh, no it just, it, we just wrote a song, and I think that's when songs are at their best, is when you channel the character in a particular moment, and the yeah. real... Mo emotion comes out. So anyway. So I'm going to play this a little lower than the key of Audra, so here we go. It's not necessary, though. Right. And you're singing in your falsetto, <laughs> I'm right, I'm singing in my falsetto. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy played piano, played it very well. Music from those hands could catch you like a spell. He could make you love him for the tune was done. You have your daddy's hands. You are your daddy's son. Ooh. Daddy never knew that you were on your way. He had other ladies and other tunes to play. When he up and left me, I just up and run. And then it goes, there. it gets dramatic. <laughs> gets but from dramatic. just that little chunk, right. she's superstitious, she's passionate, she's impulsive, um, she's romantic. And the music is like a memory of the man, which I love. That yeah. gentle thing. It was a good afternoon. It was a great <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> and a good and you got food afterwards. Yeah, we got food. <laughs> and they <laughs> fed you. Excellent yeah, that's good. <laughs> Bill, is there some song that you wrote that never made it into a show that you really yeah. like? Actually, the song, uh, What More Can I Say from Falsettos, started, I was, I was supposed to write uh, Mary Poppins with Wilfred Leach many years wow. ago. And Wilfred di died of AIDS and, and, and I, I was, but Pamela Travers had just okayed um, my writing it and I, I wrote the song which eventually became What More Can I Say, though at the time it was called something else. I've, I've written some things that haven't happened because of, uh, business mistakes uh, having to do with rights and so forth. Um, I actually wrote a, uh, 
a one-act opera based on the Butter Battle book. You did? Yeah. I, I knew that. Oh. Which is sort of sitting in a drawer. Wow. Uh, and, uh, what is the Butter Battle? It's a, Dr. <laughs> Dr. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful Dr. book. It's a Dr. Seuss book. It's part of, a little portion of it is in, in Seussical. And oh, in Seussical, that's mm. right. I, I'd love to hear too. that. Do you, do you have a tape of that? I'd um, love it was, to hear that. It was sort of pre-recording. Of, it was, I was uh, 18 and 19 and 20 when I was doing it. It's, it's almost all orchestrated and it's, it's sitting in, in a file somewhere because it's sort of Audrey illegal. Geisel, but, give this man the rights. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens if you write and you don't own the rights? You, you, you have to can't you buy the rights? We had been given an early kind of go-ahead uh, by the uh, Geisel estate. Um, but oh. then I think uh, it turned out that Marvin Hamlish, who's wonderful, uh, was interested in it. And uh, oh. ABC was thinking of doing it. And um, that's sort of how things lay out. Um, and you, know, you have to be very careful with with rights, and I was I felt protected in my little bubble, and I thought, well, nothing bad's going to happen to me, and uh, it probably I mean, who knows? It, it might have been awful anyway. So well, you know. maybe it can come back. Can't you redo them and put I'd them in the to, next? I'd do you love have to. other things in drawers? You have many drawers. At full this of, point, I, I'm beginning to have a trunk. For a long time, I had <laughs> songs that I had a thing trunk. <laughs> but now I have. Now I worked on a, a, a version of The Princess Bride for quite a while, while and and that that is uh, now you know. Filling out my trunk because that that's probably not not going to happen, and then there there is a lot of material that's been cut from shows that have been produced um, rightly cut. I love to cut, and that's sitting there. Um, so, but you don't throw them out. No, no, yeah, I, mean, I absolutely <laughs> recycle whenever possible. But we tailor They're the our. the mad women in the attic. We all have these yeah. crazy yeah. Things, right. attempts that just lock them locked away. Blue Moon, for instance, was done in four shows before it ended up sticking. Right, mm -hmm. right. There, there've been. Uh, Business problems with, with with me too, uh, where I wrote a a very successful show. We had very successful um, workshops of it, and then um, the producers let the rights lapse oh, wow. after I'd worked on it for five years, seven oh. years. Make me a song has uh, a few of the, the songs from that show. You've used your own personal health problems. Well, not only music, my health your, problems, just my life. I mean, your life. I mean, well, I, I think it's more interesting. The one I, about your brain. You wrote a musical about your. I did write a, a thing about my brain, but it was also about my life. Uh, it was about my family, and it was about genetics and genetics going awry, and <laughs> um, the bad trait will always predominate, which is the law of genetics. Why is the smart son always the gay son? <laughs> second law of genetics. It's. It's. it's I just thought. Um, you know. People have always used their lives in a lot of art forms, and the musical, musical is a very conservative art form. And I thought, write confession, like write like confessional poetry. Robert Lowell, you know, let's mm -hmm. let's see what's happening. Use your life, and uh, I always wanted to be very Whitman-esque. So, um, <laughs> you know, um, I always had army armies of, of men, multitudes, and and then then my own little family, you know, and. Everyone has an interesting family. They just have to make it interesting. <laughs> what do you advise young people who might want to be starting in this business? Use your own material? Well, I, you know, I, I you... teach down at NYU, uh -huh. I, a master class, in, and where I give an assignment, whatever. And they, they should either write from their life, I tell them, or make it sound as if they're writing from their life. Mm. Make it sound that's absolutely true. So these are these solo songs for the most part, and uh, hopefully story songs, because I feel that theater is where you can tell the best theater songs. You can't understand the lyrics in any other music. Um, and theater, it seems, the only place you can understand the lyrics. So you might as well tell some good stories. So, so we, we, we try great. and great tell time. stories, and, um, and just, I mean, we, and they're, it's remarkable how good they get by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thrilled by them. Um, I, I also think because you, this is the most collaborative of art forms, it really is. I, I, I try to encourage young writers to study about every discipline. You know, study painting, st study the visual arts, study playwriting. If even if you're if you're just writing music, you're still telling a story through the music. You know, study uh, playwriting, study uh, structure, read short stories, uh, study painting, study. You know, every discipline. Well, of course, because you have to find anything. movement, <laughs> even for God's sakes. You know, you know, because the idea is trying to find the the, the way to, to talk to your collaborators and also to open up your mind. You know? Adam, are you going to write an opera? I mean, because Light in the Piazza was 
getting a little closer than some Broadway musicals. Is I, that something you might like to do? I aspire to, to write an opera. I, oh. I hope that uh, a lot of the things that have been cut have been um, a little bit inched towards uh, an operatic uh, form, a sort of a more resid or fresh cinema kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and, I, and I am very intrigued by uh, three composed theater piece. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll turn out, but I, I am heading in that direction currently. There's something about the O word, opera. Opera, you know, that's you know, it's it's right. a, it's a loaded word. You know, I, I think that there are many interesting uh, hybrids. You know, between music theater going over to the world of opera. Uh, I know a lot of uh, American uh, opera composers that are inching over to music theater. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really healthy and exciting time. Oh, so um, I the, think Amer they the American have a music time the opera Inch guys to music theater than the music theater guys to opera actually. You do? I do. I, do. I, I, I tend to agree with that, yeah. actually. I do. The sound. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. So the American musical is not ending. We didn't see the golden age and it passed. It's still... No. We I have, don't think well, so. it's changing. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's changing. changing. It's changing and it's... Uh, I, you you know, come it's, down to school any Wednesday, 1030. Yeah, it's, 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 it's incredibly yeah. healthy. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff that they do in this ridiculous <laughs> little class it's it's amazingly good no it huh. it's frighteningly good i think the business a aspect of musicals has changed dramatically yeah. and not to the necessarily to the betterment of the form but but the the aspiration to write musicals and people who are talented at doing it and are learning to do it that just keeps on going and they'll get produced somewhere so briefly what do you uh, what do you enjoy most about your your work why are you still doing it i that's such a, I, I, I don't know why I love it, but I, I feel um, that it, it expresses who I am and I feel in touch with myself. I feel true to myself when I'm, when I'm writing. And that's, that's more the case when I'm writing than any other time. Um, and, uh, and that's why I do it. It, it feels true. I, I think I'm, I'm sticking with it. I, I think I'm in, in, in such a happy state whenever I'm in the process of writing, when I'm in, in the zone, when, when it's flowing out of me. There's nothing like that. I, I, the closest I can describe is like adrenaline or some sort of a rush. Yeah. Those words, they, don't, they can't adequately express yeah. what that feels like You know, when you're creating music. And also, when, when, it, when it feels so good, the, the music that's coming out, that you can't stop. You have to you know, repeat it. But, but for me too, it's, it's like living inside a crossword puzzle every day. You know, <laughs> I get to solve all these little problems and put words together and f figure out just the right one and I get a great deal of pleasure out of that. My, <laughs> my husband looks at me doing the crossword puzzles and thinks I'm nuts and, you know, and, and lyric writing is sort of living, living with beautiful words and, and trying to express universal emotions in the simplest, most clear, most emotional way. And, you know, at the end of the day when you write something and you go oh, and burst into tears. It's like a flower opens. You know, it's it's very hard to describe. Have you ever burst into tears? Uh, I, I admit that I have. Yeah, <laughs> uh, alone it's embarrassing. But. Yeah, it's embarrassing, but you, you do. I imagine, <laughs> burst into tears. Uh, well, wait, well, wait, you know, it's an exciting. It's a weird thing when you're writing with a partner and you get very emotional. Yeah, I, I just pretend I have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. So I can like, just like go in there, pull myself together and enough, go, and then I come out back to the piano. <laughs> And, and you know, and if you're moved, <laughs> chances are an audience will be too. That's right. That's the truth. I think matter. teaching yeah. also is is enormously emotional that way. Mm -hmm. uh, teaching is it, emotional. It, much is more it? emotional than writing for me. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, teaching is emotional. Well, writing, having written, I, I find writing is I'm as exhausted having written as I am when I run like three or four miles. Mm. Hmm. Um, I'm I'm sweating. I'm Smelly. I, I. I mean, I. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I feel like I've been through the ringer. When I. When I write, I don't find it as revivifying as you do. Um, having written, however, when I've written something that I like, I dance around the room. I, I'm, after the fact. After, after the, the birth. birth. When I'm doing it, I'm thinking. Oh, if I fuck this up, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. But. Um, I mean, I'm so nervous about screwing it up when I know that I'm onto something good. The, except when I was writing elegies, I was writing way above my head, and I don't know what was happening, but I wasn't nervous about anything, and it was coming out much more quickly than anything I'd ever written. The great joy of, of writing, of having written, is one that, that I, you know, it, it's almost sexual. 
<laughs> Speaking of sexual, there are not a lot of women lyricists, are there? Um, I think it was just traditionally a, a world of men, you know, the like old the kitchen. songwriters. I, like the kitchen, just like the kitchen. Yeah. Women, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, they're all over, and so do we. I mean, they're, they're certainly incredibly talented women writers, composers, and yeah. lyricists, but I, it's just a tradition that's starting to change, I guess. I don't know. You know. We've come to the end of our oh. uh, time to be together. <laughs> thank fun. you so very much. Thank I wish you. you all to be dancing around <laughs> <laughs> to right. your beautiful compositions. <laughs> and uh, it was a great privilege to be able to talk to you. <laughs> These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Pia Lindstrom. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theater. <laughs> the American Theatre Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theatre. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequal form for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org.